Jacksonville, the city of Seven Bridges, also nicknamed the Gateway to Florida, and as history has it, a gateway to civil rights and the birthplace of an American hero with a long list of accomplishments. What we got over okay. here? <laughs> this is from uh, the Pope. This one, this one is from Pope Paul VI. Uh, the most important picture on this wall, of course, is this one, <laughs> my grandchildren. Oh, and that American hero also happens to be my father, 87 years young, retired Lieutenant Colonel Alton Yates. Here in my childhood home, Alton and my mom Gwen remember it wasn't all that long ago something as simple as buying a sandwich at a lunch counter was a right they had to fight for for their children. I never wanted them to experience the same kind of degradation. Back in the era of Jim Crow, it didn't matter that Alton was in the Air Force, celebrated by Ebony Magazine as a space pioneer. Back then, all that mattered was that he was black, and this lunch counter was for whites only. There was a place, though, where integration was protocol, Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. This rocket sledge has been built to develop safety devices for pilots. This is Colonel John Stapp, nicknamed the fastest man alive. The incredible strain on the human body was revealed by these pictures. And it's here where young Alton would raise his hand and join Colonel Stapp in testing the limits of the body for eventual space travel. Here at Holloman, what Alton was working on for the greater good was punishing to the body. You can see him here in 1958, strapped to what was called the Daisy Track. That was the one that could travel 100 miles an hour in 50 feet. What did it feel like? It, it felt like everything in the back of your body was trying to come out through the front. But I don't regret it. At the time, Alton was dating a young woman named Gwen, but his work was a secret, so he couldn't say much about what he'd been up to. I just thought you were just, you know, out there marching. And when I saw the name Alton, I thought, well, there can't be that many Altons. And I read it and I go, my gosh, that's, that's my Alton. <laughs> Four and a half years into serving, a family emergency would cause Alton to have to return to Jacksonville. In making that drive back from New Mexico through the segregated South, the young airman did not receive a hero's welcome. He recalls one incident at a restaurant. As I was seated, two big men came up behind me grabbed me by my collar. Remember, I've got on my blue uniform, my Air Force uniform. These guys grabbed me, used the N-word, and told me if I didn't get my black so-and-so out there, I would never make it to wherever it was I was going. Well, I got the message. I bought a loaf of bread and a jar of peanut butter, and I ate peanut butter and bread 1,400 miles back to Jacksonville. I can't even process that. I, I can't even imagine what that felt like. It was embarrassing, it was humiliating, it was degrading, and it was something that I promised myself that I never ever wanted another individual to experience. By the time Alton made it to Jacksonville, he decided his new fight would be for change, joining the NAACP's Youth Council. Inspired by other sit-ins, like in North Carolina, those brave activists, some as young as 13, would sit at lunch counters reserved only for white patrons, asking they be served too. There you are on the wall there. Yeah, here <laughs> I am, seated here with other members of the Youth Council, and unfortunately, at that point, we couldn't be served. Here at the Ritz Museum, preserving African-American history in the La Villa neighborhood where my father grew up, lies a peek at what one of those lunch counters would have looked like. Normally, these peaceful sit-ins amounted to hurled insults and closed counters. On August 27, 1960, what happened at the downtown Woolworth department store would go down as a stain on Jacksonville's history. Alton revisits that dark time at nearby Hemming Park, a place named after a Confederate veteran where white men dragged Alton and others in that youth council out of the Woolworth department store and beat them with ax handles. That bloody day would become known as Ax Handle Saturday. A recently released children's book about Alton's life shows what the youth council faced. Some even carried flags or wore uniforms of the Confederate Army, an army that 99 years earlier had gone to war against the United States. The danger was obvious. 
Organizers for the Youth Council saw what they were up against. The members, mostly children, remember, voted to protest anyway. Only a few photos of Axe Handle Saturday exist, like these featured in a Life magazine spread, showing the chaos and bloodiness of the day. The mayor and local paper downplayed the true extent of that day, but the scars are still there, just like the scar on the back of my father's head from when he was struck by an axe handle. But as we visit the park this Black History Month, we notice a change. Jacksonville was once one of the most segregated cities in the South. Now you can walk around and you can eat anywhere you want. The Confederate statue to Hemming removed and the park renamed in 2020 to James Weldon Johnson Park after the Jacksonville native who wrote the lyrics to lift every voice and sing. A plaque now stands commemorating those brave young activists like my father. It is a contradiction to the mayor's statement that nothing happened in the city. Have you ever, have you ever come across any of those men who came out to attack you guys? During the, during the 40th anniversary celebration, one of the Klansmen came and joined us in the march. He apologized and he marched up here with us. The local newspaper finally recognizing history with an apology and locals recognizing him Thank too. Thank you so much. What was once covered up, now finally given its due. It yeah. was never about a hot dog and a Coke. Absolutely not. It was always about human dignity. Chris Barton, the author of that children's book dedicated to my father's life, seeking to spread the word on progress. One thing I've learned from Alton's story is, is the value of taking this longer term perspective and seeing how progress does happen, how we do move forward, even when not everything is moving in that direction. 60 years later, not everyone wants to hear the truth. My father always remains an optimist. You see over and over again some of the brutality that men of color are facing in this country. It's like, how do you, you stay cannot, peaceful? You cannot lose heart. You must stay focused. You must continue the effort. You know, if you stop all effort to eliminate those kinds of conditions, they win, and we can never allow that to happen. And perhaps he's right. Right next to that Woolworth exhibit lies a dedication to James Weldon Johnson, the man behind those stirring words to lift every voice and sing. Over 100 years since those words of hope were first written, progress in action ringing through for the first time loud and clear at the Super Bowl. Because of what you and so many others have done, I mean, my kids can't even imagine not having friends, you know, of all backgrounds. As it well should be. You know, it is the diversity of this country that makes us so great. And as long as we continue along those roads, we will continue to be great as a nation.